everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Um, my name is Ellie Alter, and I'm a master's candidate at the Center for Experimental Humanities. Yeah, I'll wait a second till my slides come up, sorry. There we go, thank you. Um, so this summer I traveled to Mexico City to serve as a program intern for Just Associates Mesoamerica. Um, and before I began this journey, I worked locally here in New York for an organization providing legal and psychosocial assistance to asylum seekers. And upon getting to know a number of women human rights defenders seeking asylum in the US, bearing witness as they struggled to resettle their lives, and learning about the impressive social movements they built back home, I wondered, what could be done to empower the work of women human rights defenders and to protect them from the threats they face? In other words, what can be done so that these women are not forced to flee to survive? I'm not sure I answered this question, but this question led me um, to JAS, a global, here we go, to JAS, um, a global women-led human rights network of activists, popular, scholar, popular educators, and scholars that works to ensure that women leaders are empowered, well-equipped, and safe as they take on critical human rights issues affecting their communities. While many activists in Mesoamerica risk persecution regardless of their gender, as we are reminded with the current political repression in Nicaragua, women human rights defenders disproportionately face particular forms of violence, whether it be sexual violence in response to their activism or other modes of structural violence which render women less economically and socially secure. And for many Mexican women, infringement upon their right to dissent does not begin with state-sanctioned violence once they enter the very public arena of advocacy. It manifests itself in intimate spaces, with gender roles in the family, and with retribution inflicted within their local communities. Um, my time with JAS gave me many insights into my central question, but as to be expected, this experience brought forth unexpected lessons and questions. My wide range of responsibilities this summer gave me insight into local contextualizations of the international human rights framework and its global institutions, the role of women human rights defenders in driving progress within these institutions and holding them accountable, and the profound power of network building. Over the summer, I witnessed the impact of network building on multiple levels. First, in response to the violent political repression against student activists and protesters in Nicaragua, I saw the way that JAS organized an emergency fund to support the cost of legal, medical, and psychological services for those affected. Having myself once attempted a crowdfunding campaign in the past, I was amazed by how quickly JAS was able to reach and far surpass their goal, enabling them to rapidly mobilize funds for those defending human rights on the ground. Here lies the profound power of network building. Next, I witnessed the way that JAS's network could be called upon to join organized dialogues wherein collective knowledge is produced and disseminated. On a regular basis, JAS Mezzo's regional advisor, Alda Faccio, mediates these dialogues on a range of issues, and the resulting transcript is utilized to produce public reports. Past collective inquiries have included what is and how do we rid ourselves of sexist language, and why is the personal political? One of my responsibilities at JAS was to comb through these transcripts and to secure permission for sharing each participant's words. At times, their stories were quite personal, but not a single person I contacted refused to have their contributions published. The women participating in these dialogues come from a diverse range of professional and cultural backgrounds, and when brought together in conversation, they produce aprendizajes, a word closely resembling learnings that we don't quite have a word for in English. Um, here again, we see the profound power of network building. Lastly, I came to realize how and why JAS itself is in essence a network. In its daily operations, the organization forms an assembly of individuals from around the world, mobilizing their various perspectives, challenges, and advocacy techniques to address their common goals. Whether it be the frequent tri-continental conference calls or the convening of 5,000 feminist activists in Oaxaca, JAS's network building manifests in a kind of collective support that not only empowers women activists to continue their advocacy, but also to care for themselves and each other in the process. This is the profound power of network building. 
One of the first projects I worked on at JAS, um, a multimedia campaign celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration, is a useful example of the ways in which diversity of interlocking identities and experiences inform JAS's approach to women's human rights. The Vienna Declaration is a document that challenged the traditional paradigm of the universal subject of human rights to incorporate women's specific needs. Asserting that women's rights are human rights, feminists at the conference gave voice to the daily experience of women and advocated a transformation of human rights to include a gender analysis. I was excited to learn that these precedent-setting achievements were made possible by the mobilization of grassroots women activists around the world, including Joss's very own Alda Faccio, who took part in organizing a 1991 petition that gathered millions of signatures calling for the declaration to comprehensively address women's rights at every level of its proceedings. As a result of their hard work and strategic advocacy, the Vienna Declaration incorporated and re-energized feminist agendas within the human rights field, leading to the enactment of concrete measures, such as the creation of the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, and ultimately the adoption of the Declaration on the Elimination of Violence, to get violence Against Women in 1994. For many feminists, including some of my colleagues at JAS, the Declaration symbolizes a turning point. Human rights institutions and their doctrines began in consequential ways to specify rights according to the unique experiences of women. Some in the organization felt strongly enough about the impact of the declaration, they championed a tagline for our campaign, 25 años de ser humanas, suggesting that women have only been expressly recognized as human beings in international law since the conference. For me, this project was stimulating not only because it gave me insight into the ways that when empowered, women human rights defenders can harness their local experience to drive change on a global scale, but also because it connected back to a central question of mine during my fellowship seminar. Is the specification of human rights on the basis of gender advantageous? In other words, do this, does the specification of women's human rights reify heteronormative identities, thereby fencing women into the side of subordination, as Wendy Brown asks? Or is such specification crucial in order to counter the pervasive androcentricity of human rights? I felt somewhat conflicted when I was assigned this project. On the one hand, I understood the impact of this declaration and the reasons to celebrate it, but on the other hand, I worried about the unintended side effects of specifying women's rights and defining women's experiences. I wondered, in what ways did the declaration reinforce the boundaries of gender identity that feminists sought to dismantle? And what about those who do not identify with the gender binary? Were they left excluded or with a larger platform? These are all questions I hope to unpack in the future. And to be sure, no one at JAS was suggesting that the work of infusing the human rights field with gender analyses was completed in Vienna. Furthering that mission is precisely what JAS is engaged in. But it is perhaps because this organization is on the front lines of this work that it was fascinating to see which of these moments in history they celebrate as milestones. Um, above all, I found JAS's process of deliberating on such questions refreshing and encouraging. The team at all times showed a commitment to dialogue that all involved in the project should have the opportunity to raise their intellectual and personal qualms or questions. I guess that on some level, I naively expected that such accomplished feminists would dabble in dogma. But in fact, JAS's success in building solidarity, which spans across three continents, seems in part due to their emphasis on dialogue and complicating these feminist dilemmas, rather than asserting any one conclusion. Not only does this render an inclusive plurality of perspectives, but it also poses a different approach to my initial question about specifying women's rights. That perhaps there are no universal advantages or disadvantages to any one approach to human rights. As we so often came to understand during our seminar, each approach must be understood in its context, and no approach is safe from questioning. Put another way, as stated in a JAS publication, a lesson can be drawn from the questioning attitude that promotes feminism in the first place. When feminists, que when feminists question something, we are not denying it. We do not all have the same information or knowledge about feminism, but we have all learned to question everything. So while I gained invaluable lessons and experience that will inform my future human rights work, 
I am most grateful to the Gallatin Global Human Rights Fellowship and Just Associates for giving me the opportunity to continue this endless line of fruitful feminist questioning. Thank you.